Aloha, my name is Clyde Tomorrow. I'm an aquaculture specialist with the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources and it's my pleasure to be able to share with you the results of a CTSA supported project that's entitled Regional Biosecurity, Operational Biosecurity and Diagnostic Surveillance. Uh, this is the second year of the project and it focuses on a particular pathogen that impacts tilapia that occurs both in the wild and also uh, for fish that are being farmed. Uh, I would like to introduce the project work group members and also co-authors of this presentation and they are Kathleen McGovern Hopkins, Ruth Ellen Klingerborn and Dr. Bradley Fox, all of whom join me and belong to the SITAR, uh, Dr. Jim Brock, Dr. Lee Yamasaki and also Nathany uh, Antonio, all of whom work with Moana Technologies. Last but not least, our newest member, Dr. Esteban Soto, uh, who is with Ross University, located located in the West Indies. Uh, this presentation focuses on the second year of the Regional Biosecurity Project and differs from the first year where the focus was on developing the capacity of a laboratory in Hawaii to con the conduct conventional PCR testing uh, for an OIE listed pathogen known as Coherpes virus or KHV. The current project focuses on developing the capacity for conducting conventional PCR testing uh, for a pathogen that affects both wild and cultured tilapia as well as other species both uh, in Hawaii and also abroad. It's been called by many names and during the first early years when it first uh, came out in Hawaii it was characterized as a rickettsia-like organism and hence uh, labeled RLO. Uh, it would later be called TRLO, where the T denotes its uh, association with tilapia. And with continued research, its association with other fish species, it would be later uh, become known as PLO, where the P denotes Pisces. Uh, the level of funding from CTSA for this project is 50000 uh, but it is only made possible through the generous uh, contributions that are being made uh, by all of its collaborative partners. And I must point out, that without the contribution being made by Moana Technologies, uh, this project would never have taken place. Uh, the official reporting period is between April 30th, uh, 2011, uh, ending in May 1st, 2012, uh, although the work had actually been initiated starting in the year one of the uh, initial project. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a special mahalo and a great big aloha uh, to many contributors towards this project and without which uh, we would not have had been able to make the kinds of progress uh, that was made and achieved in such a short time. Uh, specifically, they are Shermia Aiea, uh, better known as Bula Aiea, uh, both Ilima and Robert Lastimosa, Leon Bright, Stan Kudama, and Ron Koza, all of whom are allowed project work team to sample their fish and work with us in a collaborative fashion and actually carry out some of the experimentation that took place. Uh, their contributions were outstanding and cannot be uh, underestimated. Uh, this project is indebted to all of these individuals for both their generosity and their cooperation throughout the whole project. Okay then, so uh, why this project? And it actually begins back in 1994 uh, when wild and farm-raised tilapia were experiencing heavy mortalities to an unknown disease. And in fact, I distinctly remember during my first year at the University of Hawaii, which is in 1995, and wild tilapia all around Oahu was dying in droves. Uh, I remember taking a survey going around all of the, uh, around the whole island of Oahu, and it, they were literally showing up on the shores. Uh, the mortalities were primarily occurring during the our cooler months of the year, and it had gotten so bad that the State Department of Agriculture's plant quarantine actually issued a policy uh, that that declared that all tilapia that was originating from the island of Oahu would be prohibited to be exported to the outer islands. Uh, this plant quarantine poli uh, policy actually is still in place today. And uh, in addition, uh, with the development of additional tools to, to diagnose diseases, uh, particularly the molecular ones, uh, such as conventional and now even real-time PCR technologies, uh, it stands to reason that Hawaii's aquaculture stakeholders should have access to such techniques locally. Uh, the project initially sought to establish that capacity within the aquaculture development program, uh, but due to budgetary constraints, uh, that was not possible. However, as to be shown in the later portions of this presentation, 
That capacity now exists for both KHV and for PLO or RLO uh, within the private sector through our collaborative partner, Moana Technologies. And it, it's actually fortuitous because cultured tilapia is finally becoming an accepted product in Hawaii and it's foreseeing that if we're going to continue this expansion and diversification, uh, particularly of that segment of the industry, it's going to require the availability of these kinds of technology in order to de devise a disease management program that can deal with this particular pathogen. Uh, there are five project objectives and uh, they're outlined on this particular slide. Uh, the first was to establish the capacity for conducting conventional PCR testing for PLO or RLO. Uh, this includes the validation of that technology and to demonstrate its both sensitivity and specificity. Uh, once we had this technology and we started to do a uh, survey of both wild and cultured populations, uh, this survey was then to be expanded to cover all of the CTSA's regional jurisdiction. Uh, the final two objectives actually deal with the dissemination of the results of the work. Uh, and these are to be done through the classical means of extension and outreach, uh, and that is to use uh, technical handouts or newsletter articles or even a peer-reviewed manuscript if that was possible. Uh, and of course, one of the more popular methods was to hold a workshop at which uh, information can be summarized and also allows for opportunities to obtain stakeholder input as to what would be the next steps that we should be taken. Uh, the first objective of the project uh, actually was completed during the initial year of the, uh, year of the project when Moana Technologies became a collaborative partner. Uh, they would undertake the establishment and validation of conducting conventional PCR testing uh, for an OIE listed pathogen known as Koi herpes virus. Uh, they would produce results uh, that were consistent with other laboratories around the world. Uh, this was uh, validated by participating in the quality assurance testing uh, that's established by uh, Animal Health and Veterinary Laboratories Agency that's uh, based in the United Kingdom. Uh, this result actually should not be a surprise as Moana Technology has to deal with the surveillance of seven OIE listed shrimp pathogens uh, that are routinely monitored as part of the existing uh, specific pathogen free or SPF shrimp broodstock surveillance and certificate pro program uh, overseen by the State Department of Agriculture. Uh, what is of significance, however, is that the Moana Technologies actually currently provides conventional PCR testing for KHV uh, stakeholders in the state of Hawaii. Uh, during the second year of the project, uh, they would also establish protocols for conducting conventional PCR testing uh, for FLB or, or PLO, as uh, well as validating the specificity of the tests, uh, which will be reported on in the next few slides. Uh, they also made the testing available to stakeholders statewide and have already conducted uh, t some testing for interested clients. Uh, with the addition of Dr. Soto, the project work group now has a capacity to conduct real-time PCR testing uh, for the tilapia pathogen and th uh, this particular technology brings added sensitivity and also the ability to quantify the number of pathogens in a sample. Uh, samples already analyzed using the conventional PCR testing are also being uh, processed for real-time PCR analysis and will be reported on in a future report. Uh, polymerase chain reaction or PCR uh, is a biochemical technology in molecular biology uh, that amplifies a single or a few copies of a piece of DNA and generates millions of copies, copies of this particular DNA sequence. Uh, the technology was developed in 1983 by Carrie Mullis and PCR is now a common and often indispensable technique used in medical and biological research labs for a variety of applications and one of which is the detection and diagnosis of infectious diseases. A uh, schematic of the process is presented in this slide um, but we're going to encourage the viewer actually to take some time to learn more about the process in the many articles and internet uh, sites uh, that's available. Uh, the PCR reaction requires DNA primers and a primer is a strand of nucleic acid that serves as a starting point for DNA synthesis. 
they are required for DNA replication because the enzymes that catalyze the process, uh, known as DNA polymerases, can only add new nucleotides to an existing strand of DNA. The polymerase starts replication from the 3' end of the primer and copies the opposite strand. Uh, these primers are usually short, they're chemically synthesized oligonucleotides uh, with a length of about 20 bases. Uh, they are hybridized to a p target specific segment of DNA, uh, which is then copied by the polymerase. The primers used to detect the target pathogen used in this study was described by Say et al. in 2007 and actually was used for the detection and local localization of a new pathogen, Francisella-like bacteria, or FLB, uh, that was found in ornamental cichlids. Uh, while the use of PCR methods have made important contributions to disease control, uh, there are many problems that still can arise during its use uh, due to both the spe sensitivity and specificity. Uh, oftentimes, there is a lack of consideration establishing quality control procedures and we did not want to make this kind of mistake for this project. Uh, the validity of a PCR test result should also include a direct PCR result of the same sample that demonstrates that the nucleic acids, both DNA or RNA, in the sample has not been degraded or compromised. And one way to accomplish this is to include a control PCR test for each tissue sample that's analyzed that measures the presence of DNA or RNA whose origin is from the genome of the host organism. If the PCR test is positive for the controlled DNA or RNA sequence, uh, then we are confident that degradation of the nucleic acids have not taken place between the time the tissues were collected, uh, DNA from or RNA was ex uh, extracted from the sample, and being amplified. Uh, to address this quality control issue, Moano Technologies team conducted a scan of the literature and in the manuscript produced by Avanova et al. in 2007, uh, it described a conserved area in the genome and in fish that should be ca could be used as a fish DNA control and from uh, that's obtained from tissue samples derived from fishes. As seen in the gel on the right hand side of the slide, uh, the PCL protocol was adapted for use uh, by our project our work group and this procedure is now used whenever fish tissue samples are submitted for evaluation in addition to the PCR test for the targeted pathogen. Uh, we refer to this fish DNA control primer set as COO-I, which stands for cytochrome oxidase. Uh, an example of how this control is used, particularly for samples that yield a negative result uh, for the targeted DNA, uh, can be seen starting in the left-hand gel of this slide. In this gel, three samples were prepared from tilapia caught, captured from Nuoana Reservoir, which has never been known to have an outbreak of the TLR disease. Uh, using the primer for the targeted pathogen, the PCR test did not produce any bands, indicating a lack of the targeted DNA sequences. Uh, this is not the case when the gel on the right, uh, where we all three samples were found to possess a band indicating a positive result for the fish DNA. When both results are taken together, we have a high degree of confidence that the negative result from the, for the targeted DNA sequences on the left uh, is not due to mistakes or degradation of the DNA. Uh, that's occurred during the collection, storage, and processing steps of the PCR test. Another validation step for the PCR tests uh, to detect the targeted DNA sequence uh, is to include a known positive control sample from which DNA is extracted and is included with the PCR test. Uh, a positive control sample consisting of spin from a clinically diagnosed case of TRLO, specifically ADB case number 10-87, uh, was obtained courtesy of Dr. Alan Riggs, the aquatic veterinarian with the State Department of Agriculture. Extracted DNA was subjected to the PCR testing uh, using uh, both of the primers for the target pathogen, which is the results of which are on the left gel, and also while uh, using primers for the universal fish DNA segment, uh, which results are shown on the right gel. Uh, as you can see, both results are uh, in bands indicating the presence of the targeted DNA uh, in the sample. Uh, we are not through yet with the validation steps. Uh, the next step is to extract the bands of amplified DNA from the gels um, and have them purified 
and then they're submitted to the genomics core facility at the University of Hawaii at Manoa for sequencing. Uh, the results of the nucleotide sequences that were obtained from both gels are provided in this slide. Uh, the analogy that's often used is the one of a fingerprint. And, of, uh, and just as they are, as you can see, it's very difficult to know uh, how these sequences are actually related to any particular DNA segment. Uh, however, uh, when the nucleotide sequences are actually put through a program such as the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool or BLAST program, uh, they, that uh, compares them to known sequences that are stored in a huge database. And from that, we're able to determine what sequences uh, that we have extracted and what are they are encoding for. Uh, in this slide, uh, we see that the nucleotide sequences of the bands that were extracted are matched with those that are for a Francisella-like bacteria, or FLB, and more specifically is actually for Francisella notuensis, the subspecies orientalis. Uh, so we now have direct evidence for the identity of the particular pathogen of interest, of which RLO, TRLO, and PL PLO are apparently synonyms uh, for this particular pathogen. Uh, the same process was repeated with the bands uh, of the DNA extracted for fish DNA and the resulting nucleotide sequence matches up with those found uh, in the Persiform fish order. Uh, the Persiform fish order, by the way, is the largest phylogenetic group for f in fishes. Um, all of the results so far obtained demonstrate that the project work group possesses PCR protocols uh, that are specific for the detection of not just a Francisella like bacteria, but actually specifically for a specific genus, species, and even subspecies of the target pathogen. Uh, armed with these sensitive and specific assays, the next ob objective of the project was to conduct surveys of farmed and wild tilapia populations for the presence of um, FLB. Uh, however, just as with conducting the PCR test itself, um, a protocol on how samples are going to be collected and processed for testing uh, was required. Uh, that's going to be described uh, in the next uh, slide. The first step in the collection of samples is to identify the species of tilapia being sampled. Uh, as shown in photo number one, uh, top left hand side of the slide, uh, there are a number of different tilapia species that were encountered. Uh, both in the wild as well as those being farmed. Uh, each sample uh, has to be collected, uh, will need to be coded in such a way with uh, statistical or information such as the identity, size of the fish, tissue, location, uh, can be then tracked or tracked with the PCR result that will be obtained at a later date. The next step in the process after identifying uh, what particular species uh, you're working with uh, is to either euthanize or to anesthetize the individual and the choice is actually dependent on whether the sampling process uh, is going to be using a lethal or non-lethal protocol. Uh, during the initial stages of the project uh, we actually did incorporate a non-lethal protocol uh, where the tissue of choice was the gill or, or uh, fin. Uh, after uh, obtaining uh, the, the gill sample or uh, fin sample, fish was recovered and uh, could be returned uh, to its holding facility. Uh, that's the advantage of using a uh, non-lethal method. Uh, in any case, uh, after anesthesia, uh, vital statistics such as the body length, uh, what species uh, is determined for each individual, uh, and for the non-lethal method, uh, as we mentioned, either a fin clip or a gill clip, uh, was the uh, tissue sample of choice. After uh, obtaining the sample, it is preserved in 95% ethanol. Uh, it's extremely important uh, that the dissecting tools are cleansed between each sample, uh, and the way we do it is by using a propane burner uh, that is used to sterilize the dissecting tools after each use. Uh, this step is a very necessary one as heat destroys any remnant DNA uh, that's found on the dissecting tools. Uh, <coughs> when an organ, such as kidney or spleen, is to be sampled, uh, this requires a lethal protocol, uh, and this requires a high dose of anesthesia to be used 
uh, to, to euthanize the specimen uh, for processing. The protocol for collection of tissue is actually the same as what has been described for the non-lethal method uh, and won't be covered on uh, anymore. Uh, because one of the activities is to obtain samples from far away locations, uh, we also examine the use of fast technology analysis or FTA cards uh, for the collection and preservation of DNA uh, from tissue samples. Um, if you watch TV a lot like I do, uh, movie, uh, movies like CIS or NCIS, uh, you can see this technology being used uh, where to obtain from a person uh, cheek cells uh, by swabbing inside of the mouth. Uh, these are then placed on the FDA cards where the cells are then lysed and the DNA is immediately fixed uh, onto the, uh, the card. Uh, the advantage of this particular technology is it can be stored at room temperature and would actually greatly aid in the transport of collected samples because all of these can actually be mailed uh, very easily. Uh, and one of the reasons we're looking at it. The current slide summarizes the locations for all of the positive samples for FLB uh, that was detected during the over the course of the project. Uh, these are include both farmed and wild tilapia po populations on the island of Oahu. Um, there were a total of 13 locations uh, that were f uh, that were farmed tilapia had tested positive for FBL DNA, um, as indicated by the yellow pushpins uh, on the slide. Uh, you can see the locations are not restricted along the coast of Oahu, but rather goes completely across the island. Uh, with regard to the wild tilapia, which consisted exclusively of the black chin variety or Sarotherida melanothoron, uh, every site sampled along the coast of Oahu uh, yielded positive individuals. Uh, prevalence of the positive wild tilapia ranges between 40% and 60%, uh, 67%. Uh, in all cases, in all cases, uh, did not show any outward clinical signs of the disease and should be considered asymptomatic. Uh, more sites are currently being sampled, and those these include uh, other islands as well as other fish species, and will make up the reporting of a future uh, presentation. Uh, the distribution of FLB DNA among the various tilapia species that were examined in the current project. Uh, when using spleen as a target tissue is summarized in this slide. Uh, interestingly, there are no statistical differences between the incidence of positive individuals found in wild tilapia and also the cultured variety known as the golden tilapia or Hawaiian sunfish. Uh, this species is, is Oreochromus mozambicus. Uh, the percentage of positive individuals in the variety affectionately known as coilapia or Oreochromus honorum uh, was statistically less than that observed for both the black chin and also golden varieties. Lastly, uh, both the blue or Oreochromus aureus and an unidentified variety that is thought to be uh, Oreochromus neuroticus uh, were, were not found to have any individuals that possess uh, FLB. The reason for the differences in percent positive individuals amongst the different varieties of tilapia is currently unknown. Um, however, uh, it c the possibility exists that uh, these there may be uh, more resistant varieties to FOB and obviously uh, remains to be a <coughs> an area that must be res researched um, again. Uh, the sampling of tilapia for the current project would be adjusted from the intended survey to a more opportunistic approach, uh, particularly as calls from stakeholders began to increase, uh, particularly with the onset of Hawaii's winter months. Uh, case in point is the first collection of fish from culture stock, and this consisted of only uh, Oreochromus mozambicus, or the golden tilapia variety. Uh, this was done in response to an apparent outbreak of the disease. Uh, clinical signs such as cessation of feeding, high numbers of morbid fish that are gasping for air at the surface, uh, lesions on various organs, and heavy mortalities, 20 to 30 fish per day, uh, which is characteristic of previous outbreaks was observed. Uh, Ten in individuals were euthanized and separate tissue samples were obtained from each fish and subjected to PCR testing as described. Uh, the results are summarized in this slide 
Uh, they show that only four of the ten individuals were found to be positive for FLB when using thin tissue. Uh, this is significantly lower when using gill, where nine out of the ten individuals were found to possess FLB DNA. Uh, however, all individuals were found to be positive for FLB DNA when spleen was used in the PCR analysis. Uh, clearly, uh, there are differences in the ability of certain tissues to harbor the pathogen during the clinical outbreak of the disease. Uh, gill tissue must, might also serve as a potential uh, tissue that could be used in a non-lethal sampling protocol, while the best tissue obviously uh, requires uh, a lethal sampling protocol and is apparently spleen. Uh, we would get another call for assistance, uh, but this time it's coming from a back uh, aquaponic producer, and the photographs of the actual aquaponic unit uh, is shown to s on the left of the slide. Uh, but it represented an opportunity to sample different species of tilapia uh, that were in a clinical outbreak uh, because the fish are in the same tank. Uh, in addition, uh, we're going to use the FDA card for the first time, and this was done to obtain more information about its utility. Now, from the results, uh, interestingly, three of the four uh, individuals of the golden variety were found to possess the FLB DNA, both in gill and spleen. Uh, when we used the FTA card, we actually got a lower number of individuals that were detected uh, with the infection, and this time only two of the four, uh, and not, we don't un know exactly the reason for that. Uh, only one of the four Coilopi individuals was found to possess the uh, FLB DNA, and this was only in spleen. Uh, although the numbers are still pretty low, um, we had actually expected uh, to find individuals, uh, equal number of individuals of uh, both the golden and coilopia varieties to be infected. Uh, however, that's not the case. Uh, anyway, as the data is preliminary at best, uh, it also starts to question about whether there might be perhaps uh, more resistant strains of tilapia to FLB. Uh, but clearly, this area re uh, requires future investigations. Uh, a prime example of the kinds of cooperation and willingness to work together to learn more about the disease is going to become apparent with the description of the results uh, that are summarized in this slide. Uh, the aquaponic owner, uh, per our suggestion, would depopulate the fish from his aquaponic system and let it go fallow for two weeks. And no other disinfection procedure is going to be used. Uh, two, le two weeks later, uh, we would return and we would stock the system with new, s new fish uh, that was obtained from Windward Community College where we knew uh, they were FLB free. Uh, we were then allowed to return periodically and sample the fish over the course of the next eight months and the results are presented in this slide. Uh, initially, we had been using gill samples and the non-lethal sampling protocol just to save on the number of fish. Uh, we had not yet become aware that the use of gill for sampling asymptomatic indivi individuals as really a poor tissue of choice. Uh, so anyway, the later samples, uh, we were using spleen and confirmed that FLB uh, had not reoccurred in this system. And this is the case to this present day. Uh, the basis for using this approach is actually based on the work by our, our collaborator, Dr. Soto, uh, who has reported that the FLB is only able to live outside of the host for only a few days. Uh, from this result, it would be appear that the need for a total disinfection of the aquaponic system is not necessary. Uh, however, uh, it is still very much dependent on having the availability of FLB-free tilapia stocks. Uh, we would receive another call for help. Fish are dying uh, from another backyard aquaponic producer in early February. <coughs> Uh, samples using gill and spleen, as you can see from that result, were all infected with FLB DNA. Uh, in this case, however, uh, the owner of the system is not going to choose to depopulate his fish stocks, but instead, uh, he would actually move the remaining stock, uh, surviving stock, into a new aquaponic unit that is actually shown uh, in the photograph to the right of the graph. Um, he would allow us to return periodically again to sample the fish that were still alive, and actually when we came back in May, uh, there were no outward clinical signs that the fish were still infected. In other words, uh, they were actively feeding and for all intents and purposes appeared to be perfectly normal. Uh, <coughs> however, uh, when you look at the PCR testing res test results, um, you can see uh, that the amount of FLB DNA in the gill tissue has dra 
uh, drops significantly. However, uh, this was not the case when using spleen where the majority of individuals were still found to possess FLB DNA. Uh, this result actually makes a lot of sense because as we mentioned before, uh, fish in May were actually sh uh, not showing any signs of having uh, difficulty in breathing and gasping for air that is actually typical of an active infection. Uh, apparently the pathogen in the gills has, uh, has no longer present and allowing for normal breathing to take place. Uh, while it has been suspected for a long time, uh, this is actually, to our knowledge, the first direct evidence of the existence of asymptomatic carriers of the disease, and its presence allows us to ask additional questions. Again, again showing the kinds of collaboration and aloha our group was received by stakeholders, uh, we were allowed to sample the same tank over the course of an entire year and we would conduct additional PCR testing, but this case only using spleen tissue. Uh, results of the survey is summarized in, in this slide, and while there is an apparent dip in the percentage of individuals that were, de were detected to be positive for FLB uh, DNA in the last sample, the data is not statistically different from the percentages of individuals that were infected at the outset of the disease. In other words, the results show that the FLB DNA can pr persist for at least a year after a disease episode. Uh, it remains, however, to be determined whether these asymptomatic individuals are still infectious and clearly warrants further investigation. Uh, the existence and confirmation of asymptomatic carriers of FLB DNA allowed for the project work group to conduct additional sampling to determine uh, which tissue would be most suitable for use in detecting the pathogen in asymptomatic individuals. Uh, a total of eight individuals were sampled or euthanized on June 29th, and in addition to gill and spleen, uh, blood was also uh, sampled as well. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using the FTA card in certain cases as a method of preservation. So all individuals were detected to be positive for FLB DNA when using spleen. Uh, however, a lower but not statistically different value was obtained when using split tissue preserved with the FTA card. So apparently the FTA card does have some utility, possibly. However, uh, only one individual was scored positive uh, when using gill, and none were detected uh, using blood that was also preserved with the FTA card. Uh, the results clearly indicate that the only one sampling protocol, the lethal method, uh, would be able to be consistently used to detect asymptomatic carriers of FLB DNA, and the use of the non uh, excuse me, the use of a lethal sampling protocol and spleen as a target tissue is recommended. A clinical outbreak that was occurring on a separate aquaculture farm was reported to project personnel, and a population of golden sunfish variety of tilapia was allowed to be tested. Uh, in this case, however, uh, we kept track of the sexes and the respective gonads of the individuals uh, that were then subjected to PCR testing. The results are summarized in this slide, and as we can see, two of the five females had positive FLB DNA in their spleens, but none were detected with FLB DNA in their ovaries. One of the positive females uh, was also found to be brooding a clutch of fry in her mouth, and samples of the fry did not reveal the presence of FLB DNA. In contrast, all five males were found to have possessed FLB DNA in their spleens, but none of them were found to possess the FLB in their testes. Uh, while the data is again considered preliminary, the results surely suggest that FLB is not vertically transmitted, although additional investigations are clearly warranted. Uh, project personnel were also in search of alternative and field methods that could be used for the detection of FLB in tilapia. <coughs> uh, when possible, a fresh mount of spleen tissue was prepared with the collection of the tissue being prepared for PCR testing. Uh, in this case, a qualitative estimate of the number of granulomas that were present uh, that can actually easily be visual visualized with the aid of a compound mic microscope as seen in the top right hand photo uh, were also recorded. PCR results that were then summarized uh, with the recorded levels of the granulomas present and forms the basis for the graph that is presented. As one might expect, when there are few granulomas in the spleen tissue, the percentage of individuals that were detected to be positive for FBL, FLB uh, 
DNA was also very low, only 1 in 16 individuals or 6%. Uh, as the amount of granulomas increased in the spleen tissue, the number of positive individuals detected uh, using PCR correspondingly increased. Uh, what was surprising, however, was approximately only 50% of the individuals that were detected with high levels of granulomas in their spleens uh, were also found to be positive for ethyl B DNA. Uh, while there are other causes for granulomas in the spleen, uh, the results imply that there may actually be some recovery that is taking place, uh, and as with other results, clearly an area of future investigation. Uh, what is useful from this exercise, however, is the possible utility uh, as a field indicator is that a low amount of granulomas in the spleen that can be detected using a wet mount uh, does indicate that the chances of an FOB infection is actually very low. Uh, the third objective of the project, uh, where the survey for FOB throughout CTSA's regional coverage uh, had to be deferred as the project work group uh, were more opportunistic in their sampling strategy and actually we use up all of the available funding to obtain the results that have been presented to date. Uh, additional funding has been requested and it is, it is present in the form of a new project uh, that is already commenced and this particular objective will be addressed in future work. Uh, objective 4 uh, of the project has also been completed and a technical handout has been prepared and already submitted to CTSA where it is undergoing finalizing and to be published later in the year. Uh, in addition, the preparation of this narrated presentation is also being used as a deliverable for this particular ob objective and will be hosted on CTSA's website and also that of the PI's website that is housed in SITAR. Uh, part of uh, fulfilling Objective 4 uh, has also been uh, conducted by producing newsletter articles that summarizing some of the results of the current project and these have already been published in CTSA's monthly newsletter and are, their titles are summarized in this slide. Uh, last but not least, and rather than just hold a simple workshop that would discuss the findings of the project, uh, we actually would collaborate with the Hawaii Aquaculture and Aquaponics Association and produce a kind of a mini conference where research engaged in aquaculture and aquaponic research uh, would be allowed to share the results uh, with the general public. Uh, in addition, uh, HAAA also conducted their required end of the year business meeting, uh, fulfilling their obligation as a nonprofit entity. Uh, anyway, this mini conference and meeting uh, was very successful and attracted over 110 participants from all over the state. The speakers and their presentations have been posted on the PI's website. Uh, and that uh, can be found on, uh, indicated on the slide. Okay, in summary then, uh, there is a diagnostic laboratory in the form of Moana technology uh, that is fully equipped to conduct con conventional PCR testing for FLB and is currently available uh, in Hawaii, on Oahu. Uh, there are, of course, associated costs and the processes for collection of samples, and to, to learn more about it, one should contact the PI of this project. Um, we have shown that the most reliable method and tissue to detect FLB DNA uh, requires a lethal sampling protocol and the using spleen. Uh, this means that fish will have to be sacrificed uh, for testing for reliable results. Uh, one of the major achievements of the project is the demonstration of the existence of asymptomatic carriers of FLB DNA and that they can persist for at least a year after a clinical outbreak. Um, a possible tool for the use in the field to detect the presence of FOB, as although it's not conclusive, uh, surely is much, much easier to conduct, uh, and that is to look at the level of granulomas in the spleen. Uh, this is particularly true for low levels of granulomas, uh, which appear to be a relatively good indication of not having the pathogen. Uh, another major finding is that wild tilapia or the black chin variety around the shores of Oahu are positive for FLB DNA and, the pr and uh, their pre prevalence is actually uh, rather, rather high with 50% on average being testing positive. Uh, to date, uh, we have found significant difference in the prevalence of FLB amongst various tilapia species and that suggests the existence of resistant strains of the disease uh, or it does demonstrate the fact that FLB free stocks can be established and maintained. 
Uh, another sign significant finding is that the preliminary data obtained does suggest that FLB is not vertically transmitted. Last but not least, uh, depopulation and restocking of clean stocks uh, clearly may be an effective means of mitigating the disease, particularly in closed recirculating systems such as used in aquaponic production. Uh, this is actually going to simplify things a lot and not require a total disinfection of the system. Uh, I would like to end this presentation by extending a sincere mahalo and aloha to all of the collaborative partners that contributed so much to making this project such a success. Uh, a special mahalo, of course, to all of you uh, who took the time to review this presentation. Uh, should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me, and my contact information is provided in this slide. Aloha!